You know, that's a very good question. You know, there's two billion unbanked people in the world and 1.6 billion mobile phones. And so that provides a great opportunity to engage people into financial services, uh, digital financial services, and in addition, um, new business innovation and opportunities, empowerment, enablement for people around the world, especially underserved populations. So it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity. And again, the ITU has been facilitating this and uh, you know, a, a thing that's even been endorsed by the G20 because of the uh, impact it's going to have on the world and on people. I guess this whole idea of, of uh, digital identities, I think, in terms of making the technology just more accessible. Uh, the ADAR program, for example, India is a good example where they've um, been able to provide one billion digital IDs using iris and uh, you know fingerprint rec recognition so i think that's a, an enabler so some of the um, per pervasiveness of some of the enabling technologies i think will make this all possible and also the wide proliferation of just the ability to connect today and the interest of people to connect today so you know it's really a matter of education and just proliferating getting the word out how easy it is and how enabling it is and how it can actually uh, spread to many other, other kind of ways that they engage in some way on a financial basis. It's, it's more than just money, it's about health, it's about education. Digital is really the enabler of all of that. So I think education is the, is the basis for it all. You know what? Um, I think the simpler the process will lead to less corruption, as, as you've indicated. And there's some great models like M-Pesa. And in fact, uh, Mr. Ronald uh, Webb did a fine job today in our session discussing the advantages and the penetration they had. I think there's a great model there. And our other keynote in our session was Dr. Uh, Moaz Chakshuk and uh, how they're enabling it through the Tunisian Post and even incorporating blockchain. I think all of those are provide the capability of just making it more secure. Uh, you know, providing a, a, an easier environment uh, and something that uh, should be adopted worldwide. And it's interesting that we have these uh, developing countries basically leading the world and showing the way for the rest of the world. You know, it's interesting, you know, you have the R3 consortium and there's what, probably 45 to 50 banks involved with that. There was an announcement out of Dubai and uh, using blockchain but not just in financial, it could be used in real estate. Uh, there's just a, the um, applications are endless. And you're seeing that, of course, with Tunisian Post, um, implementing blockchain, it's going to be a reality. It is a reality. Many companies are already using it. Countries are using it. And again, it's going to make things simpler, easier, more secure, I think, ultimately. You know, that's an interesting question in terms of interoperability, and I think that's the reason that, that the IT who has put together a focus group to actually come together and work on these areas of interoperability and have people like from the financial sector, the telecom sector, mobile payments, standard organizations working together, working on standards from an interoperability standpoint. So I think that's a good move forward to try to address these issues. Yes, absolutely. Uh, regulatory and policy has to follow step and, in fact, uh, have to be cognizant of what the requirements are. And I think, uh, again, the focus group and the work of the ITU and forming this, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, is just a, a great way of sharing, collaborating, and ensuring that uh, there is this um, outreach to all the member states and ensuring that they're involved as well. So.